so many different people have been telling us this. Yeah. From so many different directions. Oh yeah. Well, you know, even the the, the Dalai Lama, the Mayans, the Buddhists, the Hopis, the Kogis, Edgar Casey, the Bible revelations. I mean, you could point in any artificial direction. intelligence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. At what at what point do the computers become? Do they start thinking? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I don't think we're very far off from that. And you know, there are groups of scientists that are pushing for the event horizon when artificial intelligence literally takes over. And Neural networking. Yeah, so they, they want it to solve the problems that mankind has created. Right. But the problem with that is it creates a, a potential for a matrix type of a society. And uh, who's to say that the computers are going to do the right thing by human standards? Well, you know the myth of the golem? What's that? Tell me. G-O-L-E-M. In Hebrew legend, there was a great rabbi named Rabbi Lowe in Prague, and he created this big uh, kind of um, clay human being that with some magical spells, he endowed it with life. Uh-huh. And it, you know, it was this huge giant that went through the ghetto and it would take care of things, you know, uh-huh. clean things and kept order and so forth until one day, until slowly it devolved. Uh-huh. And uh, he had to he had to wipe it out. He had, and, and the words he wrote on the forehead to make it, to bring it to life was Emmet, and he took off the first letter so it became Mets. So he originally wrote the word truth, but changing one word, it was lies. The reason I meant is the golem becomes the, 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 the origin of, like, um, so many myths you have, like Mickey Mouse as, as the magician and Sorcerer's Apprentice, uh, where at first it's good, but eventually, hey, you know, you get overrun by the brooms, you know. <laughs> right. Um, right. Or um, Frankenstein. It was the Gollum. Well, when Israel got their first com- IBM computer, they called it Gollum Number One. Wow! So you know, to them, they felt the computers were the beginning of the Gollum. Interesting. And that it's this nice thing, and but eventually, you know, you may have to go. Whoop! Stand back. Yeah. Yeah. No yeah. kidding. Yeah. No kidding. Yeah. And, of course, if you want to go down that road, you, you can talk about nanotechnology and so on and so forth. Well, you know, it's interesting that we're talking about technology at all. Uh, it used to be the MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, was one of the few places to study technology because it used to be science and technology. And science was the dominant. And now... Technology seems to be the dominant yeah. of the yeah. two. And so that science, which is to say knowing and knowledge, uh-huh. learning, is taking the back seat to tools, <laughs> yeah. to stuff. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. You know. Yeah, that doesn't seem like a good direction. I don't know, yeah. but uh, I, I, I read recently that uh, I think it's AT and T or Sprint and Disney have invested two billion dollars to get kids at the of the age of twelve onto cell phones. Oh my goodness! And I don't know whether these. I don't know. Do you think the electromagnetic frequency affects kids more? I've read that it does. I would think so, and it's it's uh, yeah, it's said to be pretty dangerous to the brain. Uh, yeah. Well, Advertisers uh, are gearing babies and uh, one and two years old for cereal sales. <laughs> so the you know, one and two, yeah, they they they're starting out really early. <laughs> so you know we're being yep. bombarded. Yep. Yeah. So there's, I think it, there's some major shifts and changes that need to be made, and uh, you know I don't know how that would come about. 
or, you know, the methodology, but it does seem that we've gone way askew um, and we're completely unbalanced on just about every level that you can imagine. Yep, yep, Well, yep. so to tie that into Buddhism, now Buddhism is a way to achieve balance, isn't it? Didn't Buddha talk about the middle way and, and uh, so on and so forth? Some people call Buddhism the middle way. Buddhism is a made-up word in the West. Uh, they don't even use it. You know, ism, you know, was Jesus Christian? <laughs> no, he was Jewish. No. I mean, no. Gandhi says, what religion is God? Uh, the, the middle way is likened to uh, a lute string. If it's too loose, it doesn't sound. Uh-huh. And if it's too tight, it snaps. <laughs> so, you know, you don't want to have extremes. Right, right. Although the middle way as a philosophical tradition is profound. You know, we in the West think in terms of um, uh, Aristotle, it either is too tight or it's too loose. Mm. You know, it's either this or it's that. The middle way in Buddhism can say, uh, you know, A is A, A is not A, because you can't have A without not A. <laughs> uh, a is neither A nor not A. Okay. Because these are just categories. Right. Right, these are just ideas. And then the fourth one is uh, A is neither A and not A, nor A and nor A, not A. <laughs> I mean, the, the, all of this is just words. Yeah, yeah. You know, and but that each of those, this, the tetralemma of Nagarjuna, can apply to a specific philosophical um, situation. You know, like fuzzy logic yeah. was adopted by Japan five or ten years earlier in the West because they already have that kind of thinking in their uh, culture through Buddhism and their language. And so they were able to devise all sorts of interesting things like thermostats that can sort of adjust in between certain temperature standards rather than being set at a certain single point. Right. Because they could operate by fuzzy logic or a, a camera lens that you know could sort of pick a, pick a range between two numbers rather than have to be in a specific number. Whereas it took us five or ten years later because for us, we're locked into this. It's either this or it's that. Uh-huh. Fuzzy logic is, you know, well, it's, you know, it's, it's a little, it's, it, the door is half open, half closed. Yeah, yeah. You know, half and half. So, uh, yeah, I mean, balance is very, is very much about um, really being balanced. You know, it isn't just between this and that. It's just, it's on all, in all ways. It's harmony in all, in its fullest sense, senses. Well, how does one go about creating that harmony? I guess part of that is beginning to view oneself as a spiritual being having a human experience, that would be part of it, yes? Yes. <laughs> as opposed to a person with a name and a profession and a, a, a career and a, a handful of labels that are really just labels and words. Yeah, and that are just very kind of fixing something at a certain point Yeah, that's... Um, so specific, it's redundant. Right. As right. opposed to seeing ourselves as the universe having using us as its neurology <laughs> to yeah. experience itself. Yeah. You know. Hello. Yes. You know, okay. there's something I wanted to ask you about. Um, this is something that I've seen <clears throat> being thrown around a lot in the groups. Um, a lot of the people in the New Age movement and, and other movements talk about karma a lot. Uh-huh. Um, what is your sense of the, what that is and how uh-huh. it might work if it That's is a, something? I'm glad you asked. There's a, there's a number of misconceptions that come up about 
Buddhism, and that's and one of them is, um, for example, uh, well, the Afghani people have the situation they have because of their karma. Uh-huh. Uh, they brought it on themselves. Right. Um, karma is a word that existed before the Buddha. Okay. And the Buddhist spin on it is a little different from the usual Hindu uh, interpretation. So, to be very clear, before the Buddha, there was a recognition that there are causes and effects. And the Buddha's emphasis is that we each have a personal autonomy that's kind of responsible for our own um, path. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people, if if I think I'm reading you correctly, as in the New Age movement or elsewhere, because karma has become a ubiquitous word, everybody uses it, it's in the the American Heritage Dictionary now, have a kind of a, a, a sense that karma is fate, and it's predetermined. And well, well, that's my karma, there's nothing I can do about it. Right. Right? Yeah, that does seem to be the consensus. Yeah, whereas I think it's exactly the opposite of what the Buddha is about. The Buddha is telling us, for example, um, well, it's like the the little haiku, the, the person that shouts, Stop shoving! The loudest. Yeah. On the bus shoves the hardest. <laughs> yes, that does seem to be the way it is. You know, and then like that's their karma. <laughs> the person who is angry all the time has a reason to be angry because they are creating a karma of anger. Yeah, yeah. In which, you know, the, the waitress will give them exactly what they didn't want, <laughs> exactly the way they didn't want it. <laughs> Exactly the way they didn't want it the last time. The same way as, you know, I mean, there's just nothing is right to them. They're always angry, so they're unpleasant to be with, and because they're unpleasant to be with, things go wrong, because nobody right. wants to really be, you know, they're just creating, they're creating disharmony. Oh, yeah, I had an uncle like self, that. a self-validating, endless loop. Yes, yes. And there's that karma, or... You know, there's our karma that as human beings we're endowed with the capabilities of boundless things, as people who listen to your show are well aware. Uh, You know, vast, amazing potentials, which, you know, we could call our Buddha nature. I like that. And karma is, you know, awakening to the kind of moral cause and effect that everything we, and this is the interesting part too, everything that we not only enact physically and do, but also stay and think, have an equal effect, which becomes a new cause, which becomes a new effect, and becomes part of a huge web of interconnectedness. And I say it's interesting that it's what we think and what we say just as much as what we do. Yes, absolutely. Because uh, it's, you know, it's all energy. Oh, absolutely. I, I you know. totally agree with you with, on that one. Um, would you take it a step further to say that that is connected to the idea that we create our own reality? Well, yeah, one, yeah, very easily could say that. Although what, I don't want to put it into this deterministic right, right. or moralistic kind of bag. But you could say, for example, that um, uh, nirvana is the reality that one enjoys when one has let go of the needless suffering that one doesn't need to perpetuate. Mm, I like that. Okay. Uh, you could call it the pure land, for example. Or um, the reverse, you know, that one goes around endlessly, endlessly, endlessly in this kind of uh, rat cage that one is spinning by one's own action when the door to the rat cage is left open. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's 
Herzliche 